Catherine West. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's a pleasure to follow the member for Torbay, and I would fully concur with his ideas on workforce planning. And I'm going to focus my remarks on the poverty of ambition on public services in today's statement. We know that we have sky-high inflation, crumbling schools and hospitals, but it's really that poverty of ambition on public services that I want to turn my remarks to. Thirteen years of conservative cuts to social care have left elderly and disabled people going without the care they need. Long-promised social care reforms have been repeatedly postponed. Even the Prime Minister, three Prime Ministers ago, Mr Johnson, had pledged to reform social care once and for all, announcing a cap on lifetime care costs and a health and social care levy. The levy was scrapped by the ex-Chancellor in 2022 and the cap's been delayed until 2024, but I suspect this will also be scrapped. Chopping and changing, chopping and changing. Now, following publications of the Next Steps document in April 2023, many of the remaining measures from the government's white paper on social care have been cut back or even abandoned. And this includes halving the funding for workforce training, going to the points that the member before me made. Uh, funding for qualifications, funding for well-being for individuals who need that extra support to come into the workforce. There is some mention of that, Madam Deputy Speaker, in today's budget, which I do welcome. But we do need to turn our attention to the detail on the social care workforce, because unpaid, un unpaid carers have been left to pick up the pieces of the government's repeated failure to deal with the staffing crisis in social care at huge cost to their own physical and mental health and their finances. And every weekend, mainly women, crisscross the country to deal with older people, disabled people, children who are struggling. There just isn't the care workers that there were before. Over the summer, I did a survey in my own constituency of um, social care arrangements for older people and was able to visit the wonderful place called the um, Hornsey Housing Trust, which owes its existence to the one person, Margaret Hill, the sister of um, John Maynard Keynes. She founded it in 1933 and nurtured it because she felt that the underlying cause of much discomfort, ill health and unhappiness in many families was the bad conditions of their houses. And this little history written by Rosie Barton, who was the former chair of the Hornsey Housing Trusts, sadly outlines so many issues that we're seeing today. But as the years of the Trust have gone on, they have focused more and more on older folk. But this autumn statement doesn't really offer to fix the crisis in social care and hasn't, has failed to lay out a real vision for dignity, care and quality of life for older people. I do welcome the triple lock, but I think the detail of some of the issues that we're facing in our care se sector have been ignored. A Labour government would work towards a world-class national care service, transforming access to care with new national standards, recruiting and retaining more carers through better rights at work, decent standards, fair pay and proper training, with a fair pay agreement collectively negotiated across the sector as a first step towards building a national care service. The member for Bedfordshire mentioned whether there were um, regional rates, and I just wanted to correct him that there is a, a London living rate uh, for the uh, London living um, uh, minimum wage. It's a genuine um, living wage, not the minimum wage, and he should definitely look at those rates because I think they do. Um, I'll take a brief intervention. Very, very brief. I, I think the Honourable Lady puts a, exactly right, exactly right on that. Uh, I think we've just got to get the courage to understand that there are different pressures in labour markets, and as we push forward with the living wage, national living wage going up, we do need to take those into account if we're going to get the right balance of employment. Right. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, as you would know, with your lifetime of experience in social care and other sorts of public services, it's the good councils, and I have to say it's mainly the Labour councils, who have introduced living wage for all of their contracting and subcontracting, and locally in the economy that makes such an enormous difference, and I would challenge every single council to try and push more from its procurement pound. The survey results from all the places that I visited over the summer with my wonderful staff and with an ex-BBC journalist who helped me get the survey right, 55% um, of them felt that their life and the quality of their lives had deteriorated since the pandemic. The British Red Cross research reports life after lockdown and lonely and left behind. 41% of UK adults feel lonelier since the start of the initial lockdown and millions going a fortnight without having a meaningful conversation. The pandemic sh showed the importance of tackling loneliness, and it's clear that the government's strategy on loneliness is simply not working. 
the Red Cross says that tackling loneliness should be built into the COVID-19 recovery plans and that governments should ensure that most at risk of loneliness are able to access the mental health and emotional support they need to cope and recover from COVID-19. These are the very people that the, um, that the, ch the Chancellor was trying to address when he said that there was increased rates of worklessness in people you know, over the age of 50. And I'm sure that access to mental health services and emotional support is very much a part of that puzzle. As well as mental and physical health and well-being, we must also consider the impact that grief, bereavement and economic struggles that people are facing have on people's um, sense of well-being. 51% of my survey said they're unable to participate in events because they're online. And that also needs to be looked at because the digital divide is a real thing and something which desperately needs to be um, addressed by local authorities and by all government departments. 45% said that it was harder to see their GP than before the pandemic. 48% said they'd experienced a reduction in NHS services, in particular podiatry, chiropody and physio, crucial services that people need to keep mobile, once again reducing the cost to the NHS and the uh, queue of people waiting for care in the NHS. Just one point, Madam Deputy Speaker, before I conclude, the importance of primary care and that relationship <coughs> with, a GP, with a GP. If individuals are not on the internet and they go and see their GP, eight minutes is not really enough, and in some cases not even getting eight minutes every six months. There are so many people who are living without seeing a human being from day to day. For 13 years now, social care has lacked the funding and attention it deserves. Eight billion's been lost from adult social care budgets, and in my constituency, I hear from residents having to pay thousands of pounds for their care or care for a loved one. High levels of unmet or undermet care needs. The Association of Director of Adult Social Services, ADAS, estimated that around 246,000 people were waiting for a care assessment in August 2022. Final finding from my survey, survey Madam Deputy Speaker, 60% of the people that I spoke to in all different sorts of care settings said they felt lonely or isolated and 34% that they rarely had visitors. The loneliness strategy simply is not working. It's having a real effect on our economy and on our older folk. And I hope that this can be addressed as this debate goes forward. Thank you. As your